Can everyone hear? Thumbs up. Thank you very much, Debbie. Welcome, and thank you all for being here today. And today is an extremely important day because we're going to talk about the Nobel literature and the traditional Nobel ceremony is tomorrow, December the 10th, which is the anniversary of the death of Alfred Nobel. And uh, tomorrow will be the 124th anniversary of his death and very relevant to today's subject, which is poetry. It's also the birthday of Emily Dickinson. This year's Nobel celebrations are very different from previous years. Generally, they occur on December the 10th at the Grand Concert Hall in Stockholm, and there is a banquet and much pomp and ceremony. This year, because of course of COVID, the ceremony has been taken to the recipients of the awards with ceremonies individually in their hometowns. And the recipient of this year's award, Louise Gluck, actually received her prize this past Sunday in her garden in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is uh, quite appropriate, as you'll see when we come to her poetry. Now, a word to begin with about Alfred Nobel. He was a lover of fine literature and had an extensive library and a very well-honed social conscience. He wrote ironic prose himself and two works of satirical prose, and he also had a wry sense of humor. In one of his books, he said, Madam Justice has always had paralysis of the legs and has always been terribly slow. He felt so strongly about books that he said, a recluse without books and ink in life is already a dead man. He fell in love with a lovely girl who died young and he who was, as he said, wedded to the grave. And he wrote to her after her death, you say, I am a riddle. It may be for all of us are riddles, unexplained, begun in pain, in deeper torture, ended. He had a love of poetry, the English romantic poets, particularly Lord Byron, and he also enjoyed the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. One of his favorite writers was the great writer Victor Hugo, and in 1883, he wrote to him, great master, long may you live to charm the world and propagate your ideas about universal charity. Well, this idealism went on to be carried into the Nobel Prize in Literature, which is awarded for the most outstanding work in an idealistic direction. Now, the prize in literature is perhaps more challenging to a deciding committee than prizes in science, for science tends to speak a common language, while literary works tend to stand on their own. For this reason, the prize in literature is frequently awarded based on a lifetime and a body of work. T.S. Eliot, who won the, uh, the prize in 1948 for his outstanding pioneer contribution to modern poetry, described the prize as a nail in the author's coffin, a death mask of fulfilled grandeur. Well, this year, the award in, is for poetry. It was awarded in 1923 to Yeats for his highly inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a nation. The other American born poet was in 2016, Bob Dylan, much in the news this week. And he won the award for having created new poetic expressions 
in the great American story tradition. Since 1901, 113 literary awards have been given, including 16 women, including Pearl Buck, Nadine Gordimer, Doris Lessing, Toni Morrison, and Canada's own Alice Munro, who received the prize in 2013 as the master of the short story. Until recently, judges tended to shy away from anything which was difficult, controversial, or perceived as immoral. Hence, the writers who did not receive a Nobel include Colette, Proust, Stein, Brecht, Malraux, Lawrence, and Auden. Recently, the pattern has been broken and scandal in the last few years descended on the award for literature. In 2018, there was an internal scandal in the Literary Award Committee, and there was no Nobel Prize in Literature that year. There have been few years when there was no prize, most of them the war years. So last year, the, there were two awards made, the 2018 award to the Polish writer Olga Tokarczyk and the 2019 award to Austrian writer Peter Hanke. Unforeseen in the choice of these writers perhaps was the politicization of both awards. Both of them wrote about borders and the histories. Hanke came under huge political scandal and criticism for his sympathies, his perceived sympathies with the Serbs in the Bosnian War. His mother had Serbian roots. And Olga Tokacek came under fire because of her interpretation of uh, some incidents and epochs in Polish history. This year, however, after a horrendous year in our broken world, the choice has been made in poetry. And I think most of us think of poetry, at least at first glance, as a gentler art. So let's talk a little bit about what poetry is and how perhaps it differs from prose. It used to be that poetry was easy to recognize. There was usually a rhythm, whether it was iambic, uh, pendameter, uh, or some sort of verse. There was a rhythm or poetry also included verse. These days, the prose poem is far more common. So let's go back to Hegel's interpretation of poetry. Hegel said, poetry is the music of the soul. I like that definition. Samuel Coleridge said, prose is words in their best order and poetry is the best words in their best order. Shelley went a little deeper and he said, we use poetry to feel what we perceive. Generally, it is accepted that the poet searches for emotional authenticity. Or in the words of Keats, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. The poet also tends to open a portal into mystery. We set out as something of a detective when we enter into a poem. And perhaps this is why we often like to read a poem several times, going deeper each time into its meaning. So let's go into the world of the poet today and into what we perceive as a sanctuary. This year's Poetry Award or Prize in Literature is awarded to Louise Gluck for her unmistakable poetic voice, but with austere beauty makes individual existence universal. Now, who is Louise Gluck? Her bio. She was born on April 22nd in New York in 1943, that makes her 77 years old, which certainly fits uh, Eliot's idea uh, that the award is awarded in later life, politely put. 
she was born to a father who wanted to be a writer, but joined with his brother-in-law to uh, go into business and together they invented the exacto knife, uh, which is still used and received tremendous fame and success. Her mother went to Wellesley and had one daughter before Louise was born. That daughter died young. Louise also has a younger sister. From the time she was about four years old, her parents read poetry to her and they favored the Greek myths and classic stories like Joan of Arc. She started writing little poems from the time she was about five or six years old and continued to write poetry into her teens. When she was in high school, she developed the eating disorder anorexia nervosa, and this led to seven years Ah, we're up and running. Okay, we're going to backtrack a little bit on Louise Fluke's biography. Uh, did you all hear about her father inventing the exacto knife? You yes. On right. So from the time uh, Louise was four, she was already being read to the Greek myths. In high school, she developed anorexia nervosa and went into seven years of psychotherapy she took courses in poetry at Sarah Lawrence and also Columbia University, but didn't finish complete programs. Following this, she supported herself with secretarial jobs and began to write poetry full time. And her first poem was published in Mademoiselle magazine. She went on to rise quickly and have her next poem published in the New Yorker. And in the 60s, uh, her first uh, book of poetry, First Born, was published with the Rockefeller Foundation. She moved to Vermont from New York and had one short marriage and one longer marriage lasting 20 years. She had a son in 1973, Noah, divorced in 1996. In 1992, her book, The Wild Iris, received a Pulitzer Award. And she went on to write 12 books of poetry and essays about poetry. She has received every prize it's possible for uh, uh, an outstanding poet to receive, 25 prizes, including uh, the Pulitzer, the Bollingen Prize from Yale, the National Award for the Humanities, the Thomas Transnomer Award in Sweden this year, uh, and of course the Nobel uh, Prize. She moved uh, after the, uh, her divorce, she moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts and took on a course teaching at Yale where she still gives a course in the history of her, uh, the evolution of her poetry she has also taught at Goddard College in Vermont and at Williams College in Massachusetts and has a great deep love for teaching. What do the critics say about Louise Gluck? The words that are used are fierce, austere, uncompromising, ambitious, original, powerful, muted, strange, outspoken, uncompromising. Her poems wrestle with the human condition, family, love, sex, marriage, separation and loneliness, the spiritual quality of nature, the terrors, and on rare occasions, the joy of sheer existence, and many of her poems deal with mortality and trauma. Her poems are courageous. Her use of words is scarce, hard one, and her words are not to be wasted. Perhaps the first poem which hit her audience was a poem written 
or at least published in the 60s, called The Egg. And I'm going to read this poem twice. Everything went in the car, slept in the car, slept like angels in the doomed graveyards. Being gone, a week's meat spoiled. Peas giggled in their pods. We stole. And then, in Edgerton, I heard my insides roll into a crib. Washing underwear in the Atlantic. Touched the sun seer's light well that could devour water. After Edgerton, we went the other way. Until a loft beyond the sterilizer, his enormous hands swarmed, carnivorous for prey, beyond which, dripping white, stripped open to the wand, I saw the lamps converging in his glasses. Dramamine, you let him rob me, but how long, how long? Past cutlery, I saw my body stretching like a tear along the paper. I heard this poem, I heard Louise Gluck in the 80s read this to us at Bennington. And after she read this poem, the air went out of the room and we sat in silence. Clearly it's about abortion. This was the 60s that she wrote it. Abortion was not legally available and it was shocking. Let's look at it one more time and look at the mysteries involved, the doomed graveyards. My insides rolled into a crib. Everything went in the car, slept in the car, slept like angels in the doomed graveyards, being gone, a week's meat spoiled, peas giggled in their pods, we stole. And then in Edgerton, I heard my insides roll into a crib. Washing underwear in the Atlantic, touched the sun seer's light well that could devour water. After Edgerton, we went the other way, until a loft beyond the sterilizer, his enormous hands swarmed carnivorous for prey, beyond which, dripping white, stripped Open to the wand, I saw the lamps converging in his glasses. Dramamine, you let him rob me, but how long, how long? Past cutlery, I saw my body stretching like a tear along the paper. In interviews, Louise Gluck becomes irritated when it's suggested that her poetry is autobiographical but I think all writers have a little element of that. Most first novels are particularly autobiographical. What she wants to come across is the universal in the individual experience. And she says that her life experiences are relevant only as they are, are paradigmatic, a recognition for human experience. She says that she has the words and then she searches for the context, a house, as it were, in which to put those words. Her 1992 collection, The Wild Iris, which won the Pulitzer, is a series of allegorical poems. The voices of the poems are each in uh, the voice of a, a flower. So let's take the wild iris. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting, then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. Then it was over. 
that which you fear, being a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly, the stiff earth bending a little, and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. You who do not remember passage from the other world, I tell you, I could speak again with whatever returns from oblivion, returns to find a voice. From the center of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows on azure seawater. And in the same collection, she has the red poppy. It's one of my favorites. The red poppy. The great thing is not having a mind. Feelings, oh, I have those. They govern me. I have a Lord in heaven called the sun and open for him, showing him the fire of my own heart. Fire. What is, heart, what is fire if not a heart? Oh, my brothers and sisters, were you like me once, long ago before you were human? Did you permit yourselves to open once, who would never open again? Because in truth, I am speaking now the way you do. I speak because I am shattered. At a more mundane level, we come to a little poem about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in suburban Long Island. In every room encircled by a nameless Southern boy from Yale, there was my younger sister singing a Fellini theme and making phone calls while the rest of us kept moving her discarded boots or sat and drank. Outside in 29 degrees, a stray cat grazed in our driveway seeking waste. It scratched the pail. There were no other sounds, yet on and on the preparation of that vast consoling meal edged toward the stove. My mother had the skewers in her hands I watched her tucking skin as though she missed her young, while bits of onions misted snow over that prolonged death. The Greek myths were second nature to Louise Gluck, and here is one of her longer poems, Persephone the Wanderer. In the first version, Persephone is taken from her mother and the goddess of the earth punishes the earth. This is consistent with what we know of human behavior, that human beings take profound satisfaction in doing harm, particularly unconscious harm. We may call this negative creation. Persephone's initial sojourn in hell continues to be poured over by scholars who dispute the sensations of the virgin. Did she cooperate in her rape or was she drugged, violated against her will as happens so often now to modern girls? As is well known, the return of the beloved does not correct the loss of the beloved. Persephone returns home stained with red juice like a character in Hawthorne. I am not certain I will keep this word is Earth home to Persephone? Is she at home, conceivably in the bed of the God? Is she at home nowhere? Is she a born wanderer? In other words, an existential replica of her own mother, less hamstring by ideas of causality. You are allowed to like no one you know. The characters are not people. They are aspects of a dilemma or conflict. Three parts, just as the soul is divided, ego, superego, id. Likewise, the three levels of the known world, a kind of diagram that separates heaven from earth from hell. You must ask yourself, where is it snowing? White of forgetfulness, of desecration. It is snowing on earth, the cold wind says. Persephone is having sex in hell. Unlike the rest of us, she doesn't know what winter is, only that she is what causes it. 
She is lying in the bed of Hades. What is in her mind? Is she afraid? Has something blotted out the idea of mind? She does know the earth is run by mothers. This much is certain. She also knows she is not what is called a girl any longer. Regarding incarceration, she believes she has been a prisoner since she has been a daughter. The terrible reunions in store for her will take up the rest of her life. When the passion for expiation is chronic, fierce, you do not choose the way you live. You do not live. You are not allowed to die. You drift between earth and death which seem, finally, strangely alike. Scholars tell us that there is no point in knowing what you want when the forces contending over you could kill you. White of forgetfulness, white of safety. They say there is a rift in the human soul which was not constructed to belong entirely to life. Earth asks us to deny this rift a threat disguised as suggestion, as we have seen in the tale of Persephone, which should be read as an argument between the mother and the lover. The daughter is just meat. When death confronts her, she has never seen the meadow without the daisies. Suddenly, she is no longer singing her maidenly songs about her mother's beauty and fecundity. Where the rift is, the break is. Song of the Earth, song of the mythic vision of eternal life. My soul, shattered with the strain of trying to belong to Earth. What will you do when it is your turn in the field with the God? And in that poem, we see her blending of psychoanalysis, mythology, and poetry. Now, since tomorrow is the birthday of Emily Dickinson, who was born in 1930 and died in 1986. I thought we could do a little comparison of Emily Dickinson and Louise Gluck. The secretary of the Nobel Prize uh, Selection Committee said of Gluck, in her own severity and unwillingness to accept simple tenets of faith. She resembles more than any other poet, Emily Dickinson. Now, Dickinson was outspoken. She was certainly severe. She remained single all her life. And she wrote at that time of the role of woman. And it's very interesting to look at the Chronicles of Womanhood by Dickinson and by Gluck. So let's start and look at what Emily Dickinson said about marriage. Even though she never married, she wrote a poem called The Wife. So Emily Dickinson's The Wife. She rose to his requirement, dropped the playthings of her life to take the honorable work of woman and of wife. If aught she missed in her new day of amplitude or awe, or first perspective, or the gold in using wore away, it lay unmentioned as the sea develops a pearl and weed, but only to himself is known the fathoms they abide. Louise Gluck on the wife. As I saw it, all my mother's life, my father held her down like lead strapped to her ankles. She was buoyant by nature. She wanted to travel, go to theater, go to museums. What he wanted was to lie on the couch. and a little more gluck on marriage. All week they've been by the sea again and the sound of the sea colors everything. Blue sky fills the window, but the only sound is the sound of the waves pounding the shore angry, angry at something, 
whatever it is must be why he's turned away, angry, though he'd never hit her, never say a word probably. So it's up to her to get the answer some other way, from the sea maybe, or the gray clouds suddenly rising above it. The smell of the sea is in the sheets. The smell of sun and wind, the hotel smell, fresh and sweet because they're changed every day. He never uses words. Words for him are for making arrangements, for doing business. Never for anger, never for tenderness. She strokes his back. She puts her face up against it, even though it's like putting your face against a wall. And the silence between them is ancient. It says, these are the boundaries. He isn't sleeping, not even pretending to sleep. His breathing's not regular. He breathes in with reluctance. He doesn't want to commit himself to being alive. And he breathes out fast, like a king banishing a servant. Beneath the silence, the sound of the sea, the sea's violence spreading everywhere, not finished, not finished, his breath driving the waves. But she knows who she is, and she knows what she wants. As long as that's true, something so natural can't hurt her. Both Emily Dickinson and Louise Gluck wrote uh, extensively about nature, and each of them also wrote about dying. Their take on dying varies, however. Emily Dickinson said, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held out, but just ourselves and immortality. And in her second poem called Dying, Dickinson says, the sun kept setting, setting still. No hue of afternoon upon the village I perceived from house to house twas noon. The dust kept dropping, dropping still, no dew upon the grass, but only on my forehead stopped and wandered in my face. My feet kept drowsing, drowsing still. My fingers were awake, yet why so little sound myself unto my seeming make? How well I knew the light before. I could not see it now. Tis dying I am doing, but I'm not afraid to know. One of the strongest poems about death written by Louise Gluck is called Averno, after Avernus, which is a small crater lake 10 miles west of Naples, Italy, which was regarded by the ancient Romans as the entrance to the underworld. Averno, you die when your spirit dies, otherwise you live. You may not do a good job of it, but you go on something you have no choice about. When I tell this to my children, they pay no attention. The old people, they think this is what they always do, talk about things no one can see, to cover up all the brain cells they're losing. They wink at each other. Listen to the old one talking about the spirit because he can't remember anymore the word for chair. It is terrible to be alone. I don't mean to live alone, to be alone when no one hears you. I remember the word for chair, I want to say. I'm just not interested anymore. I wake up thinking, you have to prepare. Soon the spirit will give up all the chairs in the room, won't help you. Now, occasionally, Louise Gluck shows her ironic or what clo comes close to an ironic sense of humor, dark though it is. This is the end of a poem all about Blizzard. Blizzard was a dog which was a cross between something big and fluffy and a duck's hunt. Blizzard, a cross between something big and fluffy and a duck's hunt. And the poem says, Daddy needs you, Blizzard. Daddy's heart is empty, not because he's leaving mommy, but because the kind of love he wants, mommy doesn't have to give. Mommy's too ironic. 
Mommy wouldn't do the rumba in the driveway. The poem finishes by saying, I thought my life was over. My heart was broken. Then I moved to Cambridge. And from that point when she moved to Cambridge and started teaching younger poets at Yale, she lived alone and her poems became a little more hopeful. One of my favorite poems is a poem called Flowering Plum. And we're getting hopeful here, keeping in mind that Luke deals with trauma and deep pain. In spring, from the black branches of the flowering plum tree, the wood thrush issues its routine message of survival. Where does such happiness come from as the neighbor's daughter reads into that singing and matches? All afternoon, she sits in the partial shade of the plum tree as the mild wind floods her immaculate lap with blossoms, greenish white and white, leaving no mark. Unlike the fruit that will inscribe unraveling dark stains in heavier winds, in summer. And my all time favorite is a little poem from Wild Iris called Snowdrop. I didn't expect to waken again, to feel in damp earth my body able to respond again, remembering after so long how to open again in the cold light of earliest spring. Thank you, Louise Gluck. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much, the Niagara Public Library. Thank you so much, Debbie, for all the work you've put in and all the devotion that you've shown to making this series a success. Thank you, Christine, for your tech support. I'd like to thank Bill Brown for uh, uh, bringing about the Nobel series and for the lectures which he gave. And I'd like, like to thank my fellow lecturer and husband, David Elkins. Thank you all. And I hope to see you all next year in the same room. Be well, stay safe. Thank you.